And this morning we're going to be, we've made it to chapter 4 of 1 John, 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. You can go ahead and open your Bibles up, and I forgot to say this at the beginning, and as you do that, I know Julie and I thank you for your cards, text messages this week as we traveled to Massachusetts for her grandmother's uh, memorial service. Everything went well. We had safe travels up and down, uh, had a nice uh, um, time with family around the service, and a nice a nice service. It was um, a Catholic service, so it was a little bit different. We would have... I would have done it a little bit differently than, than the priest, but uh, a nice time celebrating uh, hit, uh, uh, her, Yvonne's uh, uh, life there, 88 years, uh, 86 years uh, here on earth. So we thank you for your cards and messages of support. As we begin this morning, I do have a question for you, and as you open up the first John chapter 4, hopefully this thing will click for me, um, you get ahead here and look at the screen. Does everyone know what this blue check mark? Has anyone ever seen these before and understand what they represent? Especially when you see a blue check mark on a social media like Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Uh, if you haven't heard of these or don't know what they mean, when you see them, these are blue check marks and they are on the accounts that they are beside, to telling you that this account is verified to be the person that it is claiming to be. Why is that needed? Well, if you've ever been on the internet, if you've ever been on social media, you know that what you see might not always be what you are actually getting. Many of you have maybe encountered a fake profile, a fake account posting as someone else. Some of you might have been hacked and had your Facebook or your another social media taken by someone and someone used your account and posed as yourself. Blue check marks, though, they exist. The process of verification which an account has to go through to get this blue check mark beside their main. They exist so you, the user of the social media account, can have confidence and assurance that the account that you are viewing and interacting with is actually the person that they are claiming to be, that the information and content that is coming from them is actually coming from said person. And I say all that to say and to begin this morning and to ask a question is, if it, wouldn't it be great if God's voice came with that same blue check mark system, specifically if God's spirit, if the words of God, the leading of God, the spirit of God came with a blue check mark that gave you confidence and assurance that what you are seeing, what you are sensing, what you are hearing, what you are feeling called to is actually coming from God and not from yourself and not from the world. We've all, I would say, in some form or fashion, wrestled with determining what is God's will? What is God guiding me to right now? What is God's voice saying to me in this particular moment? We probably, in some form or fashion right now, in this place, are discerning what is God's will for my life. And what we have here in 1 John chapter 4, 1 through 6, is, is maybe not a blue check mark system to give God's stamp of approval to whatever you are discerning in life. But what it is, is a way that you can take whatever you are discerning, Whatever you are feeling and whatever you are sensing, whatever you are healing, what, hearing, whatever you are feeling led toward, and place that beside God's word and, and compare it, discern whether or not the voice that you are hearing, the tug that you are feeling is actually from God or actually from elsewhere. As I mentioned at the beginning of the service, last week John mentioned for the first time in his letter as we closed out chapter 3, there, for the first time, he mentions the third person of the Trinity and the Holy Spirit. And what he does is he opens chapter 4, is he brings us to this way of determining if the Spirit, as John will say it, if the voice, the tug, the calling, the leading that you are feeling, a way that we can discern if it is from God, if it is God's actual Holy Spirit that we are sensing, or if it's any other spirit, if it's the Spirit of truth, which is the Spirit of God, or the Spirit of falsehood. So let's read that romance that John gives us to reading through the spirits of this world. Again, 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. John writes, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether or not they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come into flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus Christ is not from God. For this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them, because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world, and the world listens to them. 
We, however, are from God. And whoever knows God listens to us, but whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. What John tells us here, as one himself guided by the Holy Spirit of God, is he tells us how we can discern what is the Holy Spirit of God, if we are hearing the voice of God or not. If we are sensing the work of God or the work of the falsehoods and the spirits, the many spirits of this world. We can, and the way that we do that is we can lay what we are sensing, what we are feeling over top of God's word. The big idea of this morning's message is that God's word is God's gift that allows us to not only hear, but to properly heed his voice in our lives. That God has given us this wonderful gift, his very word, the Bible. The Bible in its 66 books, it's 66 books. Some are letters of poetry, some are letters, some are revelations, some are historical accounts of what has taken place. The Bible, regardless of its form of literature, it is 66 books of what God has done through his Son and through his Holy Spirit in the world. It is written by man's hands, but it is all. Every book, every word of it is guided by the Holy Spirit. 66 accurate accounts of the work of God's redemption through his Son and through his Spirit. But it's not only given to us as a historical textbook, as a way of knowing what has happened as a way of knowing what God has done, but it's given to us as a way of knowing and discerning what God is doing and what God wants to do through us and in us today and tomorrow. I thought about, I think I've mentioned this illustration before a few times through our, uh, our letter of this, uh, our study of the first John, because John talks about this same reality in chapter two, this reality and challenge of the Christian life that is weeding through the noise of this world the noise of the Antichrist, which remember what an Antichrist is, as John used the terms. It's just any spirit or thing that is against Christ. And we know that there are a lot of those spirits to weed through in our lives and in this world as believers. But how we can weed through those things and determine that which is actually God's voice, what Jesus would actually do if he was in your shoes. And it's like using one of of these things. Does everyone remember what these things are? Maybe using one of these. These are overhead projectors. I have an overhead projector slide. And what you can do, what you would do back before computers and those types of projectors, you could lay this slide down. This one says Jesus on it. You can lay that down and this would project up and through that mirror to the wall or the projector screen, whatever is on this slide, it goes through here and to the wall. With overhead projectors, you can project small things and make them big things for everyone to see. And you can also, with overhead projectors, I remember mom doing this for several projects back in the day, you can also project an image from this small sheet of paper onto a bigger sheet of paper that's at the end of the lens. You can take something small, make something big, you can take something that already was and make something new. Right? You can create a new thing, an exact replica, but it's a new thing of that which already was. And that's the same idea that John is relaying to us, not only here, but throughout this letter. We, in God's word, in the Bible, we, through his word, and amidst this world that is speaking everything in everything into our lives, except God's word and the truth of God's word, we can lay whatever we are seeing, hearing, sensing, seeking out in our own lives. And if it lines up with God's word, then we can take confidence and assurance knowing that what we are sensing, hearing, and seeking out is actually stemming from God. And we can wholeheartedly and assuredly pursue that. The reverse then is true though too. If we, what we are sensing, if what we are hearing, if what we are seeking does not align with God's word, then we can throw it away and turn away from that path and, and seek after God's uh, will, word and, and ways again. We can, again, literally take God's word, lay it out, and, and use it as the lines to seek how well and, and how we can follow him in our lives, in our roles of submitting to Christ and sitting under the leading of his Holy Spirit. We can take God's word and use it as the guide rails as we follow the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And all that is a bit of a long runway to help us see and understand what these six verses in 1 John are helping us to do. To hear and heed God's voice, God's spirit in our lives. 
And in the first voice, in verse number one, this, these verses gives us three different things that we need to understand as we seek to, to understand God's leading in our lives and discern God's leading amidst the endless numbers of spirits and voices in our lives. The first thing that it teaches us is that to begin this disciplined life of, of following God, we must acknowledge that there are numbers of things that we already have been, that everyone is following someone or something. That even if we are someone, that even in a world where there are a lot of someones who vehemently declare that they are blazing their own path, that they are marching to the beat of their own drum, that they are saying, doing, believing things that have never been said, done, or believed before, they actually are not, right? right? We are all following someone or something. King Solomon, in his wisdom literature, summarizes this truth beautifully, that declaring that there is nothing new under the sun. John says in verse 1, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have already gone out into the world. There's a couple of things in this verse that I think we need to see from its truth. One, again, there is nothing new under the sun. Even as we sit today, 2,000 years after Jesus walked the earth, even as John wrote 1 John less than 50 years after Jesus walked the earth, even then there was a massive need for believers to test that which they are hearing, that which they are heeding, determine whether or not they are actually following and hearing the voice of God. Now think about it. Not only was the, the movement in John's day, the way of following Jesus Christ, not only was it just coming into its adulthood, but it was only reached, it had only spread, it had only just begun its mission of spreading and covering the globe with the gospel. It had only just begun going from nation to nation, from people group to people group. The gospel of Jesus Christ in John's day had spread to a relatively small section of humanity, especially when you compare it to, to where the gospel is spread today. And so with that in mind, it stands the reason that there were already in John's day many false spirits that needed meticulous testing in the earliest stages of the spread of the gospel. How much more is it, is it needed today? According to, to, to Wesleyan University, there are over 33,000 denominations that declare themselves to be Christian across the globe. I saw some estimates that there's upwards of, of 45,000 Christian denominations in our world. That's a lot of the voices, that's a lot of spirits, to use John's language, that are speaking to us and speaking to the world in God's name. You can go home this afternoon and likely, through a, a very simple, quick Google search, you can find the church, you can find a denomination that will confirm the belief that you already have, your understanding of the Bible and its truth. And if you don't find a denomination out of the 33,000 that exists that confirms your belief, then just start one. What's 33,001, right? What's one more? And that's been the, the approach of the church for centuries. But it's the thing that, that the Apostle John, it's the same reality that the, uh, the Apostle Paul speaks about in 2 Timothy chapter 4, starting in verse 3, when he says, For a time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine, Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears already want to hear. And in doing so, they will, they will turn their ears away from truth, and instead they will actually be hearing myths. John, Paul, other, Peter, other teachers of the New Testament, other apostles say, for your own good, for the good of others, and for the good of the gospel, we must test what we hear, we must test what we obey, what we heed, and see whether it is actually truth, and it's actually the truth of Jesus Christ. Again, because there are any number of things seeking and hearing our obedience, seeking our obedience and what the truth is and our understanding of truth. That's, and the, that leads into the second thing that I want us to see from this verse, and I think you can probably pick it up, but what are the spirit, or where are the spirits that need testing actually stemming from? John says, where are they coming from? Are they coming from inside or outside the church? Right, John says it's not that, that these spirits have just snuck in to the church. John says these spirits, these against Christ spirits, a huge claim, these spirits that are, that are rebelling against Christ, they've actually gone out from the church 
and into the world, not the reverse. So to us as followers of Jesus Christ, that's of course to our shame because it can lead us down the road and will take us down the road of, of wrong belief. But it also, even at greater stakes, it leads the world down the road of wrong belief in Jesus Christ. It gives them a false assurance that they are following the God of the universe when they're actually just hearing what their itching ears want to hear. The New Testament is very clear. We need to test the people that we listen to. We need to test the people that we follow, the people that we give a place of leadership and authority to in our lives. Like the, the overhead slide, we need to meticulously test, does this person, the things that he or she say, the way that he or she says them, the things that this person does, the way that he or she does the things that they do, do they line up? To go back to the previous weeks in our study, are they imitators? Are they imitating Christ? Are they exemplifying Christ? Are they pointing me and everyone who will listen to them to Christ or to themselves or to something outside of Christ? And this is important, I think, especially in an election season, not just are they invoking Christ's name, not only are they using the things of the Bible and of Christ as talking points to score political points and to get them votes, but are they actually surrendered to Christ? Are they exemplifying the whole life encompassing and changing ways of Jesus? Over times, John says we don't, we don't have to look outside of the church to see where those types of against Christ, anti-Christ spirits exist. So everyone is following someone. We have to understand from the beginning. The question is not if we are following something, but who are we following? Is it God's word or is it something or someone from the world? And then in verses 2 through 3, John actually gives us this three-pronged test for how we can live out our God-given responsibility, how we can actually test that which we are hearing and heeding. First, we have to the, understand that those who follow God, they actually know the God that they follow. And that might seem obvious, that might seem elementary, but remember biblical knowing is actually different. Remember what biblical knowing actually constitutes. Biblical knowing is not just like the world's knowing. It's not just about head knowledge. Biblical knowing is not just about the intellect, even intellect that we have about God and his ways. But biblical knowing is both knowing God and his ways and actually living out God and his ways. It starts and it overflows through our lives. It's when our intellect about God becomes life application. It's when God's ways actually become our ways. John says every spirit that is from God, it acknowledges two things. That Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, number one, and then that Jesus Christ in the flesh has come from God. Here John takes us again, as he's done almost every week in our study, he takes us back to the incarnation of Christ. The reality that God has left, Jesus Christ, has left his rightful and his royal throne. He's been born of a virgin, yet conceived by the Holy Spirit. He's been born of flesh, but also of God. Meaning that he was 100% God and simultaneously 100% man. And that as the God-man, he lived the life that we could never live, facing all the same trials and temptations that we face. But unlike us, he never fell to sin. He never rebelled against God. And he did this. He lived this life so that he could and that he did on Calvary's cross make the sacrifice that takes us, the old Adam, in this old flesh that has fallen to sin, that has been overcome by sin, and through his perfect death and his perfect life, he's put away sin through death itself, and he's given all who believe, all who call upon his name, belief through his resurrection. That this gospel contains the truth of who God is and what he has done through us, through his son, Jesus Christ. Remember, the fruit of knowing this is not only in our head, but it will travel to our hearts, and it will cause us to begin to live as Jesus has lived. Lived as Jesus lived, as we are still in this world facing all the same trials and temptations, weaknesses of the flesh that he faced while he was in this world. The first way that we can test whether or not that voice in our head or the voices that are outside of our head are actually from God 
that the who or the what that we are following is actually God is by knowing and analyzing if our knowing of God is being poured over both our actions and our attitudes. Does what we are hearing and what we are feeding actually sound and look like the God that, that gave all of himself, including his life, for the good of all others, for the good of all his, uh, his neighbors, even ones whom hated him? Those who follow God know God, and then they act like it. They act like they know God. Second, John says those who follow God profess Jesus as the God made flesh that he is. As we have talked about, and as we know is true of our lives, in John's day and in our day, all these years later, there are many claiming to speak and live for Christ that are actually in the way that they live and the way that they speak, denying Christ. In John's day, we've talked about it, there were the Gnostic heretics that said Jesus was human but only took on a divine nature at his baptism. Or there were the heretics on the other end of the spectrum that said Jesus only appeared to be human, but he was actually the whole time just spirit. And in our day, there still exist those blatant rejections of God and his word, of Jesus and his incarnation like there was in, in John's day. But there's also more subtle rejections of Jesus and his word. Maybe it comes in the form of taking something of Jesus, a truth of Jesus, like God loves all, and saying that God is going to forgive all. Now, it's true that, that God loves all and that through belief and through our profession of faith, God loves all and he for, forgives all. But there is that, that very important part of belief and in following of Jesus that we have to repent of our sin to receive his forgiveness, right? For his love to be received in faith, we have to trust and obey, right? As the song says. It also looks like in our world, again, John is writing to the church to make sure that they are testing that which they are hearing, not just in the world, but in the church. That it also looks like in our world that, that this profession of the full truth of Jesus must be a part of our, our testing. Whether or not we are sitting under and in submission to all of God's word and all that God's word brings about in our lives. And what I mean by that is, is God's word is, is not just a pick and choose self-help book. It's not something that only has seven principles for a healthy marriage or 10 tips to raise your kids or five tips for your single days, right? The Bible has all of those things. God's word has all of those things, but it also has much more than that. Professing Jesus Christ personally, being in a place corporately that is professing Jesus Christ means we study and we seek to apply all that Jesus Christ is as the God of the universe made incarnate, as the God of the universe made flesh, dwelling among us and now ruling over us. Those who follow Jesus profess Jesus as the God made flesh, and this truth encompasses every alley and fashion of our lives. Those who follow God profess Jesus as the God made flesh, and those who follow God, they also listen to God. This is another truth of God's word that John reminds us of this morning that may seem uh, elementary, that may seem obvious, but remember, just like biblical believing is different than worldly believing, biblical listening is different than, than worldly listening. Remember back to early stu studies, uh, early weeks in our study of John, as early as week one, John writes these words and these truths at the end of an era. At the end of the era of the apostles, as John writes these words, he is the last living apostle. Remind ourselves, what does it mean to be an apostle? It means to be one who has seen, who has encountered, who was an eyewitness to the risen Lord Jesus. And so, of course, 2,000 years later, there are no apostles left. And when John writes these words, there's only one left, and he's that, that one. And what John is writing this whole letter to combat, even in this early infant stages of the church's life, even when they were still an eyewitness to the risen Lord, to the life and teaching of Jesus Christ around, even in this early stages, people were wandering away from the truth. People were refusing to listen to the truth of God and his word. And so again, 2,000 years later, how much more is that true? 
But what we need to know is what God has done through his spirit. What we need to understand is he has given us in his word, even 2,000 years after John, the last living apostle, went to be with the Lord Jesus Christ, is he has given us an accurate account or first-hand account of what the apostles taught and what they experienced. He has given us, again, either eyewitness testimony through apostles like Matthew and John and Paul and Peter and Jude and James, or he's given us careful uh, accounts, careful historian accounts of, the, of the, what the eyewitness encounter through the pens of, of people like John Mark, through the Gospel of Mark. Mark sat down and spent time with Peter as he preached the word, and he wrote down meticulously what Peter experienced beside Jesus. Or Luke, who set out and did write, and these are Luke's own word, who wrote an account of the things that have been fulfilled through Jesus among them. Just as it was handed down to us by those who first were eyewitnesses and servants of the world. With this in mind, Luke says, I sat down and I have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, and I do too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. Why did he do this? He did this not only for Theophilus, but for us, so that we may know the certainty of the things that we have been taught. There are no lost books of the Bible. There are no, and there is no need for new revelation from God. We don't need to search our attics for golden plates from God. We have all that we need. We have all that we need to know with certainty the things of God which have been taught for, for 2,000 years. Actually, what we have in God's word, through the power of God's spirit, through the power of God's word, is that through the Bible, we are actually ourselves sitting under the teaching of the apostles. We're sitting under the teaching of those who encountered for themselves, looked into the eyes of themselves, for themselves, the eyes of the risen and resurrected Lord Jesus. That's why we practice here expository preaching. We're not in our preaching in any way creating something new. Rather, what we are doing is we're taking what God has already clearly and fully revealed about himself, explaining it and seeking to help others, to help you, to help ourselves apply the truth that Jesus has revealed to us in our lives. Right? That's what expository, if you ever hear that word, expository preaching is. So God, listen to God. Listen to his word, not only when it comes in sermon form, but be in God's word for yourself. Listen to God's word. Read God's word. Spend time in it daily for yourself. Those who follow God, they listen to God. And then finally, in verses 5 through 6, know that you can actually tell a lot about a presenter, about a leader, about one in authority, not only by looking at them, as we've talked about, but actually by looking at their audience as well. John says it this way in verse 5, they are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world and the world listens to them. However, we are from God and whoever knows God listens to us. But whoever is not from God does not listen to us and he's speaking, the us that he speaks about is the apostles. And then he says, this is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. So what does this all mean? Well, when living out your God-given responsibility to test that which you are hearing and heeding in your life, don't only to test the leader of a movement of the or a teaching, but test the audience of this leader and teaching as well. Why? How? John says simply, those who are from God, they listen to God. The world will not listen to those from God. Only those who are from God will listen to those that are from God. And in reverse, those who are from the world will listen to the world, and constantly, consequently, those who are from the world, they will not listen to those that are from God. So you can not only test the one that is at the head of a movement or a belief system, but you can and you should test their audience as well, the corporate body that is a part of said movement. Test them with the same three-pronged test that you teach ideas and, and leaders of movements. Do they really know the God that is testified to in Scripture? Do they act like him? Do they desire the things that he, they, he desires? Do they speak? Do they forgive? Do they give? Do they sacrifice like he gave, forgave, and sacrificed? 
not their, not their leader, the, the he or she at the top of their movement, but their God. Do they live like that God lived? Do they profess? Is it clear that at the head of their movement is not their leader, but, but their God? Many, movement that claim, many movements that claim God's name don't actually make it clear that God is the one that they are worshiping, that God is the one that they are submitted to. And then do they listen to God? Is there evidence that they have and that they are saturating their lives with the truth of God's word? That they are actively seeking to grow in the grace and knowledge of their Savior, Jesus Christ? Or is there more evidence that they are seeking to grow in something else or to grow something else? An audience will tell you a lot about a leader. So we're coming down to the end here. How do we take these truths and apply them to our lives. I have three things to write down, underline, and also John tells us to take confidence in. The first one may sound like a strange thing to take confidence in, but let me explain it. First, know that followers of Jesus understand believers in church that the world, the lost world, will not listen to you. All right, and that's a, that's a strange thing to take confidence in, but John says it and lays it out quite clearly for us this morning. But the question is, how is that a confidence? Well, we know that, that ultimately from this, the, the heavy, heavy burden of turning a lost individual, that heavy, heavy, heavy burden of turning a lost world to Christ is not upon our shoulders. Don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that we should not open our mouths and tell the truth of Jesus Christ, that we should not proclaim the gospel through our, our mouths. We are Peckway Evangelical Church, which means we are people of the good news of Jesus. That means that we should be, individually and corporately, we should be taking every opportunity God tells us to tell people the truth about Jesus. But ultimately, what John tells us today and reminds us of is that's the easy part, right? The really hard work in gospel proclamation is not just telling the truth of the gospel, but getting a lost world to respond in faith to the truth of the gospel. Telling the, getting the world to respond in in obedience to the truth of God's word. That's the hard work. And that's why the burden of that God is not upon our shoulders, but it's upon God's shoulders. That means that no matter how weak, no matter how insufficient, no matter how uninformed, traditional, or cutting edge, however good our evangelism is, however weak our evangelism is, Ultimately, lost individuals being found in Christ is entirely the work of the Holy Spirit. For it's only he who can call sinners to, to realize first their need for a Savior, realize their need for saving from sin, and then lead them to repentance of sin and find their saving in, in no other name but the Lord Jesus Christ. So take comfort as you proclaim boldly the gospel that the lost world will, will not listen to you. But speak up anyway. Speak up for Jesus and his gospel. Do so knowing that the success or the failure of your gospel sharing is, is not on your shoulders. It's not your world to get, your duty to get them to listen. It's only your duty to share and let the Holy Spirit do the rest. Know that the world will not listen to you and know that the lost world will also not live like you lived. The lost world will not live and act out your belief system. Lost people are just that. They are lost. They live as lost people. They behave as people who don't know God. Why do they do that? Because they don't know God, right? But yet so often the first thing that we as the church seek to do is not help them know God, so often the first thing that we make clear to the lost world is not that we want them to know the God that we know, but the first thing that we try to do is to change their behavior, not their belief. The first thing on our agenda, our list to do, is to get the lost world to live like God tells us to live without them actually knowing God. Like God calls us first to behavior remediation and not first his son as their savior. The lost world, the, the people outside the fold of God, outside the church, and living as if the Bible is not a, not, not, does not have a place of authority, they live like that because they believe that God's word doesn't have a place 
of authority in their lives because they are lost, because they are outside the fold of God, because they don't hold God's word as the ultimate authority like we do as believers. I know it can be hard for us, as, as many of us have spent our entire lives in the church and, and believing the Bible, but, but not everyone has had that experience. Not everyone believes the Bible has the ultimate authority for life and for the afterlife as we do. So we need to understand that. We need to not demand that of lost people so be, before they ever have a chance of, of hearing that good news of Jesus Christ. But instead, we need to make our mission not to just change the behavior. The Holy Spirit will take care of that in their repentance for sin. But we need to introduce them to our and hopefully their Savior. We need to help them know God so that they can know why God is worth following. The lost world will not live like believers. They will live as though they are lost. And finally, a careful reader of scripture and listener to this message would have noticed that we jumped over verse number four in our study. And I did that intentionally because it's, it's such a wonderful truth that applies to so many facets of our lives and our following of God that I wanted to leave us with it. The world will not, even though many days it appears as though it is, the world will not overcome us. The world will not overcome those who are in Christ. John says it this way. Here's this truth of our God. He says, you dear children, you believers are from God and have overcome the world. You've overcome those outside the fold of God. How have you done this? Why have you done this? Because the one who is in you, that Holy Spirit, is greater than the one who is in the world. This means that all the spirit of all those in all the ways who are against and rebelling against Christ, they will never, they have never, and they will never overcome Christ. All the fallacies of false teaching, they have never, and they will never be able to knock you off the firm foundation that you have in Christ. This means that all the effects of sin, all the effects of this fallen world, of Satan and of sin, cancer and addiction and broken relationships, lost loved ones, those whom we desire but have yet to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, all these things that weigh upon us, all these things that try to tell us that they are being, that make us feel like we are being, that even Jesus is being overcome, they are not, and he is not being overcome. You, dear children, if you profess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you are in God. And through God, you have overcome the world. In you lies the one who is greater than anything that is in this world. So take heart. Greater is he who is in you than the one who is in the world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we thank you for this truth of your word today, Lord, and we ask that you would write it upon our hearts, Lord. As we have said many times throughout our study, as we experience in many ways as we go about our lives, there are many spirits, there are many falsities and false ways of belief in the church. There are many delicacies of this world and of sin that are tempting for the allegiance of our hearts, Lord. But help us to know and to really know in a biblical sense in the way that you that your servant John, that your Holy Spirit is pointing us to know, know in our hearts that, that you are greater than anything we would experience in this world. To help us to know the, the effects of that knowing, know the, the true lengths of your greatness, Lord. Know that first, you are greater than any of the fallacies of sin, that there, there's no pleasure in this world, there's no knowledge in this world, there's no way of life in this world that is greater than you greater than knowing that you have laid down your life for our sins, that you have come into the world not to condemn the world, but you have come to save the world through your son and that your son has given his life and that through our belief in his resurrection, we can know that though we fall and we stumble to sin, our sins are forgiven and we have a new and eternal life. And then as we go about this life, this eternal life that begins in Christ today, that we get to go about seeking to live out your ways, your ways that are greater than our ways in the world's ways, Lord. 
Help us to have a desire that is within us, that burns within us to, to know your ways and to know you better and to live out your ways more perfectly and intimately in our lives, Lord. And from that, may people through our individual witness, through our corporate witness as Pequot Evangelical Church, may people be drawn to your son. May people be curious and have a desire within them to know you better. And then out of that, Lord, out of our faithful gospel proclamation through both word and deed, may souls be saved, may souls be won to the kingdom of God. May we have stories to tell individually and corporately here at Peckway Church of people finding the grace and mercy of your son, Jesus Christ, for the first time, of people rededicating their lives to your son, Lord Jesus. And may it all be done to the honor and glory of Christ Jesus, the name who we will sing and give glory to right now. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Please stand and worship with